I'm Terry Johnson. I'm the National Coordinator for Lifelong Singing in ACDA, which is the coordinator that uh, has an umbrella that um, hopefully provides resources and support for both sacred music and community choir singing. Mm. And you all are the decision makers here today because, in fact, the idea for this very important topic in the <laughs> webinar came directly from our membership. Many of us uh, have the great honor and privilege of conducting choirs in which singers are achieving what we might say maturity in their uh, physical uh, ability to sing. And uh, certainly we all want to continue to offer them the best pedagogical practices, repertoire, uh, tools, so that they can continue their singing throughout their lives. So we have a panel today that will give you unbelievable resources from a wealth of experience and uh, kind of the definitive ideas physiologically uh, about the voice and the body as it ages so that you can serve your singers uh, the very best that might be possible. Before I introduce the panel, would you uh, please remember, you know how every concert you conduct begins with the admonition to turn off your cell phone? Well, in the same way, a webinar begins with the admonition to mute your microphone for Zoom, because if you don't, we'll experience all of that feedback that's so, um, that keeps us from being able to hear the panelist or the person who's speaking. So. Uh, please take a moment right now just to double check that you are muted. Someone is not because I could hear them even while I speak. So uh, now's the time. Uh, double, just double check. Um, we're going to uh, have three panelists today. And so that you can anticipate the format, what we plan is for each of them to give about a 20 minute or so presentation on the topic that they've been asked to cover then we'll save about 10 minutes for questions. So that we can answer the most questions possible, what we will do is take questions through the chat feature of the Zoom meeting. Likewise, if you're watching on Facebook Live, you're welcome to place a, a, a comment or question in the comments on Facebook Live. Uh, our folks are busy uh, watching those chat rooms and will relay the questions and that way they'll be able to edit down for to avoid duplications of questions and uh, get more things covered in that way. So keep an eye on uh, the time and if it's uh, going to soon come to the end of the presentation, then be sure you type your question in and we'll get to as many as we can. Of course, we may, uh, we anticipate a lot of interest and so we may not get to all of them. So let's get on with it. I'm very, very happy to introduce you our first panelist. She is Karen Brunson. She's uh, co-chair of the Department of Music Performance at Northwestern University. She is a mezzo-soprano, immediate past president of Nats, served as president and president-elect from 2016 to 2020. She was program chair for the 2016-54th Nats National Conference in Chicago and was a Nats intern master teacher in 2013, governor of Nats Central Region from 2013 to 2016, and she expanded the activities of the Central Region to include an annual conference along with student auditions. She's been a member of the esteemed American Academy of Teachers of Singing since 2013, was president of the Chicago Singing Teachers Guild, and vice president and president of the Chicago chapter of Nats, where she started the annual vocal competition. And here's the crucial reason that we called upon such an experienced uh, pedagogue today. She is author of The Evolving Singing Voice, Changes Across the Lifespan. And this is the quintessential resource for you regarding the singing vo voice, excuse me, the singing voice as it ages. It chronicles changes in respiration, vibration, resonance, and the impact on realistic age-appropriate expectations for vocal development throughout the lifetime 
of singing. So let's welcome Karen and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Even though most of my life was as a singer, my husband was a high school choral director and I went to Luther College. And so I sang under the famous Weston Noble and he spoke at my wedding and I sang at his funeral. And so my, I so value this committee and community and I am a member of ACDA and a diehard. And I've sung in choruses my entire life. I continue to sing now in our church choir, which is a really good church choir. And I am an aging singer myself. And I know what it feels like to age. I know what is going on. And so um, I'm going to share my screen with you for the rest of my time here. And so here we go. And then we'll start right in with all of that. Okay. So this is, you can see the title of my book there as well. Um, and I encourage you to uh, uh, take a look at the book. It's, I think it's really helpful and it, all the things that we're gonna talk about are in here. So let's go to the first slide. Lots of things happen to us as we're seniors. We have limitations, but guess what? We always did. We, as a baby, we had limitations, as a teenager, an adult, as a, an aging adult, and now as an aged adult, we have changes. Every age has its limitations, but there are no age limits for singing. So challenging yourself at every, every age is a good thing, including as older people. We know we're gonna have less oxygenation going on. Okay, take more breaths. We know that our muscles lose some of their strength, and especially by age 80, about 80 or about 30%. Okay, challenge your support and do what you can. The vagus nerve, our nervous system, works a little bit more slowly. So my coloratura is a little more challenged, but I don't let that stop me. I do what I can. I know that the, my lungs and bronchial function has diminished about probably mine 60%. And it's probably between the ages of 40 to 80 that it kind of goes down during that time. So I need more time to take a breath. So will your choristers. I know that we suffer some hearing loss from some of us, maybe many of us, that, in, that affects how we hear ourselves sing and our internal and external sense of sounds. We need to concentrate a little bit more or a lot more. Our registration narrows. We can't go as high or we can't go as low. Our vibrato is a little slower. The color in our sound, we can't quite get some of that ping. We just have to continue to make mindful efforts though. You're better for the effort. Your memory is affected, you know, what was the words to that one, my favorite anthem? I don't quite remember it. We do have a loss of neurons. Hey, use your music, you know, there are solutions. We know we have less water content than a newborn has about 80% water content, adults about 60%. Drink more water. My husband was just told by his doctor to drink more water, makes a huge difference. Reflexes are slower. Be careful when you drive. Concentrate more. Know your patterns for when you're singing or when you're driving. It's harder to stand for a long time, maybe harder to move. Well, sit down, you know, or use a stool. There are options for us. So we have very, very different hormonal lives between male and female. On the top here, you can see the male hormonal life. So early on, right after, after, uh, right after they become a fetus, um, right after that, there's a surge of testosterone. It goes down quickly, lays dormant during childhood, then it kicks up again right at puberty. And it goes really, really high to the age of 20, then kind of stays okay, but about starts going down about 1% a year. And then what, until about the age of 70, when it's about 50% of what it used to be. For the female, we don't have this surge in the, as a fetus. We just are dormant until we are go to puberty at that point, then we have a surge of our estrogen and progesterone. And then the female cycle begins. And we, once all of the eggs are used up and we're not, don't have as much estrogen, then the, the cycle stops. That can either be a surgical menopause or a natural menopause. And then it doesn't come back. It just stays lower. 
Some people elect to take hormone therapy and some people don't for good reasons. I did not myself. Everything we do in singing is gonna be the interaction of respiration, vibration, and resonance. So first let's look at the breathing aspect of things. As a young person in this top picture on the right, this is a younger person, their ribs can go down more and they can go up and out more. As we get older, we get sort of a barrel chested kind of thing right here. And that is male and female, but especially male. And some people who were thinner when they were younger and think that they've gained a lot of weight, maybe ne haven't necessarily, but we don't have quite the, the rotation possible with our ribs as the younger person did here. And here we don't have as much. And I just had a student, a 60 year old student who took a lesson with me and at 60 years old, his ribs are staying out more of the time. They don't go down as far. And so he thought he'd gained weight and he was doing weird things singing because he was sort of flexing, trying to look thin all the time. That was counterintuitive to the voice. And so when we finally said, excuse me, sir, that's, that has to do with bones and bones. You can't really change that so much. So you need to give in to your older process. Here we can see females and what we go through as far as our postural change and why when we get measured later on, we've lost an inch or two or more. And we can also notice the chest, how that changes too. And so it will be, it'll be pretty hard to tell somebody who's older, 75 or more to you know, get your chest up a lot. You have to, your expectations have to be a bit different and understand that some of this has to do with the bones themselves, not just wanting to stand tall or anything. And here's a male and you can see in this one showing that can even get compression fractures and you can even develop osteoporosis. And hopefully that's the exception, not the rule. Now we'll look at deeper inside and we can see up in the upper left-hand side, we see the muscles. Now we know that we lose muscle strength and so here you can see all of these muscles. This is a rectus abdominis. Here's the biggie, the oblique muscles. And all of these lose some of their muscle strength. And I now at 67 really feel that. So when I support, I feel it. And when a muscle isn't as strong as it used to be, or you're trying to increase the strength of it, you feel it. And so you have to become more mindful about the give the relaxation and the engagement of your muscles of support. Going deeper here, the lungs themselves change too, and they are tissue. They don't have their own innate muscles. They have the muscles around them that are causing the air to go out, but they do have elastin fibers and the elastin fibers aren't as elastic as we get older. And there's collagen fibers in, in there too, and they sort of take over more, which means when we take a breath, our, our, our lungs have to recoil. They get kind of smooshed up and then they have to recoil. That takes a certain amount of time. And we'll talk about that in a second. Then here, looking even deeper inside, we can see our trachea and the bronchioles and all the branching out, which is an incredible thing that happens. And at the ends of those, moving from this picture to this picture, you can see the alveoli. And the alveoli are where the gases are exchanged, in with the good air, out with the bad air. As we get older, these some of the, the little berries that it looks like, it, they thicken and there's not as much air that can be in them and then not as much can go out of them either. And that's a very simplistic explanation of all of that, but they start to collapse on each other and aren't as functional. These are nothing that you could exercise and pre prevent. I, my brother's a doctor and I asked him about that. He goes, no, it's just gonna happen. It's normal. Normal's not always better. Normal is something that changes and it's normal that we are changing as we get older. This is a great picture. So on the left here, we have a normal lung. I don't like that they say normal lung. That is a normal adult lung, young lung. On the right, that is a normal aged lung. 
even though they said aged as, and so it's unnormal to be older. No, it's not, it's normal. But look at here, we have the tidal volume here and the tidal volume here. And this is what it takes just to sit around and breathe, watching TV, that kind of a thing. We have about the same amount on each side. Then we notice that we have the ERV, which is expiratory reserve volume. And we have this much of that in adulthood. We have this much of it in older age. Then down here, we have reserve volume. And we have a lot of it. We don't, we don't have much of it because we use a lot of our air when we're in our prime time. Let's call it prime time as adults. But as we get older, we have a lot more residual volume. Therefore, this is the air we can use to sing with and the tidal volume. We can't use all of the air. So you notice sometime around age 50 or so that you're singing along on a hymn, for instance, and shoot, you have to take a breath, an extra breath in a line. All right, take it, you're gonna need it. And you have to make the very best of what you do have. And that includes those muscles around your ribs and your posture. It's gonna take more to, to make it happen. And you're gonna notice it. So here's a couple things that you could do. So if you're sitting in a chair right now, if you just go, I love to use zzz, and the straw, you've probably heard of all these semi-occluded vocal tract exercises. And so if you take your knuckles and put them in your sides, right in your sides and dig in deep and you go, you have just exercised those muscles and go, just doing that is helpful. Also, as you're sitting there, we're gonna think of a V to the pubic bone, which is right, right way down. And if you just go, notice how that kind of tucks. Again, you have exercised a muscle. And I call that feeling tucky-wucky. Then just sit there and feel your rear end against the chair. And if you can sneak in and see my picture up there too. So your rear end is gonna go whoop, and then when you take a breath, it lets go. And then whoop, and then it lets go. So nobody needs to know you're thinking about it while you're sitting there in choir, but you can go and you can feel it. And, it's, and that tells you that you are doing some good. Then you can put your back against the chair and push real hard and do the same thing and you will feel your back muscles. Then you can take the heel of your hand and put it on your pecs real hard. And if you go, you will even feel that those muscles engage a little bit. Just doing that, you have exercised those muscles and given awareness to it as well. This is a picture of the larynx. Now we'll move to the larynx. So the larynx when you're born is real spongy and it gets harder through life but it doesn't register on an X-ray as a bone actually until about the age of 20 to 29. So right over here, you can see that the, um, that the ossification, the hardening of the larynx is happening up until that time, but it will register as a, as a bone at the back of the thyroid. Then 30 to 39, it's a bunch more. It's more bony, let's call it but not a whole lot. And that is kind of prime time because there's enough flexibility to do the most rigorous, tough things of singing. And then as 40 to 49, it's more so. By the time you're 50 or so, for males, it's often completely would register as a bone on an X-ray. In females, not usually. That doesn't mean anything as far as what you can or can't do, but you might have a little bit more rigidity in your options. This is a vocal fold. And so we know the outside of it is an epithelium and that needs to be moist. And we know we have dryness. So that is a little bit compromised sometimes. And so more water is a good thing, less things that would dehydrate you, like my Diet Coke in the morning, which I still love, and coffee and um, alcohol, things like that. The next layer in is that gelatinous layer, which is real, has a lot of good viscosity. It can really wiggle a lot. And then the next one is elastin tissues. 
And both here in the purple area, which where we have the more gelatinous stuff, that starts to not be quite as mobile a little bit. And the elastins in this layer start to be not quite as elastic. And this is your collagen and it, some of those change too. And the vocalis muscle, like all the other muscles in our body, doesn't work quite as much as it did. Some of the parallel fibers of that start spindling off. And so you don't get as much, and it happens throughout your body in everything. So it will affect the vocalism a little bit. Here's a really good picture of, I hope I can get to that. Oh dear. Now my, <laughs> you can see my problem here, can't you? So my thing just went off. Oh dear. I'm sorry about that, but I'll talk about the next one anyway, and I will get my, my sharing back here. Um, just turn it back on as we go. But the next slide was going to show you kind of comparing to fabric what can happen. Um, and I really love that a lot. So we're, we're back here. Such is the world. There we go. And I will quickly get to the right slide. Okay. And so here we go to, you can review all those as we go. There we go. Okay. And so this shows you is kind of like a fabric. So you can see the outer layer, that's kind of like your cheek inside. Then that next layer where it's supposed to be gelatinous is sort of, sort of more like that, comparing it to a fabric. The middle layer has a little more to it with stretchy parts to it. And then finally, we get the um, collagen kind of area, more like cotton string, it says. And here the thyro thyroarytenoid is the muscle that's really knitted in there pretty well. Now we'll look at some vocal folds. And here's adult vocal folds. Um, prime time, uh, probably anywhere between 20 and 45. And here's the next picture, which is older vocal folds. And you can see in this the, um, that it's kind of very vascular around it. And you can see here that the vocal folds don't want to turn and don't want to come all the way together here in the middle. So things you can do for that are like creaking and I'll talk about in the next one, but get a good picture of that. Our, our vocal folds get a little bit lax and that really makes a difference to our efforts too. We have to get a little more purposeful in bringing the vocal folds together. Here's some things to remember having to do with vibration. You need a loose throat all the time, but that doesn't mean you need loosey goosey support. You actually need to actively engage a little bit more mindfully, maybe a lot more. Sensations that you've had in your head, you know, that you can feel the sound in your head, as a classically trained singer, I feel a lot of the singer's format in the ring. I keep going for that. I don't get quite what I used to, but I still have that, that acoustic reference point. And then the, the idea is that we can sense that our vocal folds are coming nicely together when we have sort of decent kind of, um, a, kind of an acoustic. Um, and we know that ah is one of the hardest ones to bring those chords together nicely. If needed, a really good thing to do, and I do it a lot, is creak. And this is going, wow, wow, wow. And I do it that much, if not more. So all of you choral directors, when you have, here everybody's getting a little tired, stop. They'll, they'll instantly try to overblow instead of uh, let the chords come together and just stop and do a, uh, and then do some of those breathing things, get that going. And then you've got your vocal folds coming together. You've got the support that it takes to cause vibration. Though that's really important. So you can try all the exercises for onsets, things like that, or the ah is harder for, than, even for me, it is harder. And you can do semi-occluded vocal track exercises, which are like mm, mm, N, N, G, mm, 
Z, z, all of those are really, really helpful. And just as I just demonstrated, let the bright vowels inform the open vowels. So instead of e and the goal is that our harmonics to noise ratio, ratio HNR, favors clarity. And that's part of our, our aesthetic preference too. Now we go to the resonance, and this is a really cool picture. It's a 3D picture that this is a, a doctor at the Charité in Germany showing this new thing that they can take pictures that show us how weird the hole in our mouth is. And this changes throughout life. And so why, and it changes because bones change and because our necks get longer when we're babies and all sorts of reasons. That would be a story in and of itself to contemplate, why do we all sound different? That's why, nooks and crannies of the hole in our mouth. And this is a great picture. So interestingly, so here we have our, our lips and our teeth. I gotta get my laser. There we go. Lips and teeth, the hard palate and the soft palate and that little hangy down thing is the, the uvula, which is part of the bigger flap. And that gets a little bit weak as we get older and it can be a problem for um, swallowing. Uh, it should aid in some of that, but it's supposed to go up and block off the nasal port completely when we sing vowels like e, a, a, o, u. For French nasals, it's down. But it continues to grow like your ears do and like your nose does. It continues to grow constantly through life, the entire lifetime that you have. And very interesting, the tongue really matters. We know that. We don't know enough about the tongue, uh, but we do know that it loses facility. Now, is that because the the um, brain is not sending the signals to it enough, or is it because the muscle itself gets older and doesn't cooperate as much? But I know I've watched my own father go through the difficulty swallowing and having to learn how to swallow in special ways for that. So it matters in our singing too. Does singing help keep these things in shape? I don't know, but maybe it does. And here is something that happens just thinking about bones. And the bones of a baby, it's not quite bony as a baby here. As a child, it's creating more new cells than cells are dying. And so it grows and they have the baby teeth. Then the baby teeth go away and below the gums here, the adult teeth are forming. Then we see the ramus, which is this part of the mandible. Uh, the ramus has gotten longer and, uh, and the dying cells are, are about equal to the new cells. And so it stays rather static for a while. But as we get older, the, the dying cells outpace the new cells. And so we do have bone loss. This next picture is kind of weird and scary. And you can see here, this is an adult female. And you can see, you can imagine inside what their orifice looks like, hearkening back to the green picture. You can imagine here, and you can see this, I can see my little chin here starting to jut forward a little bit differently, like my grandma's did. And I, you know, that's how I remember my grandma. And you can see that then the neck is, the, this angle is so much different. So if you tell this person, you need to relax, you need to drop from the back of the jaw, and you tell this person to do it from the back of the jaw, go back and down, you're not gonna get the same result, are you? And in fact, if they try to look like them, they're gonna be using compensatory muscles they shouldn't be using. So that is something to consider in what you're doing. Exploring your resonance is a great thing to do. And these are just a couple of my exercises that I think really help the tongue. So I just love that you can go, um, with the first one, I like the idea of snagging some ring. So if I go bibbidi bobbidi bibbidi bobbidi boo, bibbidi bobbidi bibbidi bobbidi boo, bibbidi bobbidi bibbidi bobbidi boo, when I do that, boo, that fires off some acoustics 
The result is perfect support, perfect vibration, and optimal resonance. And they feed one another. Another one is and that tongue hitting up against the velum way in the back really helps to spark acoustics. Then you can go this exercises that the tongue on the uh, on the alveolar ridge and the g back there, way back there at the palate. Um, I also like the zing zing zoo 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 zing zing zoo. I also like the pharyngeal stretch, which I'll show you when I go off screen. And the party that you want them to continue to have is in the back of the throat. So real quickly. One way to think about all this is vocal bundles. What's a sign of vocal aging? The fact behind it, exercises, mindful concepts, and then a five-day mini challenge for your choir members. And I'll give you two examples. So let's say you're hearing a lot of lack of clarity. So the muscles of breathing have weakened. You might use the or which all of those will get them to notice their support muscles. You might also use this and uh, doing it sitting, they can really feel it. If they go from s to z, and if they do it this way, going s, z, z, they feel something extra grab on within the depths of their support muscles, which will remind them again. Then add the creaking to it. Wow, wow. And then hit a they will know they sound better. You want to encourage the needed muscles. You want to encourage the needed co coordination. Then while doing all your typical daily activities at home, choir members, why don't you think about M, M, Z, V, and various rhythms and go just as you're watering a plant or emptying the dishwasher or making a bed, you know, that's how I do it. Bundle number two. You hear that they're flatting, there's a loss of color. They might have some hearing loss having to do with that, but also their palate is less responsive. So do the pharyngeal stretches that I'm gonna show you in a moment. And the palate needs to be up, the pharynx wide. You wanna head, you wanna feed the head voice, encourage that. And you want to think of the yawn in the back of the throat, inhalation and a surprise, and then do the tell them to do the pharyngeal stretches twice a week. So I'm gonna real quickly go off of my share and I wanna just show you the pharyngeal stretch. Karen, I don't think we're seeing you. When we lost your screen, we lost you as well. I think I'm back now. There you yes. are. Okay. Yes. I'm having some Microsoft things going on here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let me just real quickly show you the pharyngeal stretch. It takes about 10 seconds. Take your the heel of your hands, put them here on your pecs real hard. Now, if you just drop your jaw and go, nothing happens here. If you stretch the back of the throat like you're on an airplane and you want your ears to open, it's a good exercise. That's not how tight you're gonna sing, but you're, you're at the back of your throat enjoys that. So that's what I have to offer. Um, thanks for spending time with me and apologies for Microsoft. Uh, thank you so much, Karen. I wish we could all enroll at Northwestern and uh, take a special topics in the aging voice and explore every single slide uh, and everything else that you would add. In a course. So let's take a few minutes uh, and Sandra, give us any pertinent questions that you've harvested from the chat room. Sure. Um, Leah Pierce says, does ongoing singing delay the progression of reduced flexibility in the ribs? Yes. And I find that out the hard way because during these last 18 months when we've been in COVID, I haven't needed to sing 
And I tend not to sing if I don't need to sing. So we didn't have church choir. We didn't have, I didn't have regular rehearsals. I wasn't in my a practice area, but, and so when I came back to it, um, I really, really felt it in my ribs, but within the five day real, rule really works. Within five days, I was a whole lot better. And then I did keep singing for three weeks in a row and what a difference that made. So yes, singing, makes a difference. And Melissa Emerson asks, what do you do with choir members who don't want to drink water as it makes them need to use the bathroom more often? Well, go to their doctor because they'll tell you that your potassium might go too low and that's dangerous for your life. And so, you know, make your choice. It's very important that you drink lots of water so that your kidneys function correctly. And that's a real problem with older people that they tend to have other problems, you know, related to needing to use the restroom more. And so therefore they don't do it, but you need to. And win-win, it helps your singing. And then uh, Leah asks, are, are all the exercises that you used in your book? Yes, they're all in my book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there might be on the, there's a, uh, I think they are also, actually the SOBT exercises is also on your handout. And all of those will be posted on our national webinars page following this webinar. So those were all that I see right now. Great. Thank you so much, Sandra. And good grief, Karen. I just feel so inspired. I can't wait to get back to choir rehearsal armed with more knowledge than I had. So thank you very, very much for joining us and uh, for hanging out with the cool kids in ACDA. We, yeah, thank uh, we you very much. <laughs> uh, Mike O'Neill is our next panelist. Dr. Michael O'Neill is the founder and artistic director of the Michael O'Neill Singers and has guided them since their inception in 1989 with his vision for attaining the highest standards of choral excellence. Most recently, Dr. O'Neill's creative vision for engaging choral singers virtually via YouTube video warm-ups, vocal technique exercises, rehearsals, and performances has served as a model for how choristers around the world can continue to be involved in singing during pandemic times. MOS Online has attracted hundreds of singers from 25 states and five countries. So I uh, asked Mike if he wouldn't join us as a panelist and at least uh, launch from the topic of uh, rehearsal techniques, vocal warm-ups, the things that he's done for his aging singers, and particularly, as you just heard in my introduction, what he did to help them during the pandemic to keep singing. So welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, Terry. And uh, I wanna thank you and I wanna thank Sandra and everyone at ACDA for uh, putting all of this together. Uh, and what a, what a necessary topic it is and uh, I think very helpful for all of us. Uh, it is an honor, I must say, to, to be on the panel with uh, Karen Brunson and, and, and Matt Hill. As you folks have already seen, if you did not know of, of Karen's work before, uh, she's phenomenal. Uh, and I encourage everyone to go out and buy that book. Uh, it will, whether you're a, a director or whether you are a chorus member, uh, the book will be so helpful to you. And uh, uh, so, and I know Matt is going to uh, uh, share repertoire ideas. And so I know why those two people, uh, Karen and, and Matt, are on this panel. I think I'm on the panel because I'm old. Uh, and so I, I appreciate it. You needed to have one old person uh, on the panel. And so here I am. Uh, but it's also true that I conduct uh, an adult community choir. Uh, normally, we're about 145 voices. We're down uh, a bit now because of post-pandemic, and we've just resumed live rehearsals. So we don't have about 110 in the group right now, but normally 145. And it's a multi-generational group. We certainly have older singers, uh, but our, in fact, right now, our youngest singers are uh, we have a couple of teenagers in the group, and we also have singers in their 80s. Now, I'm a real believer uh, in having multi-generational groups. I think it is, uh, it's 
wonderful because we learn from each other. Younger singers bring energy and vitality and an enthusiasm for new experiences. Our older singers bring experience, life experience, singing experience, knowledge, and a desire to find meaning in the things they do in their activities. So we encourage all of our singers to recognize that we're going to be able to learn from each other uh, and become a better ensemble because of the diversity that we have uh, in our uh, ages. And think about it, uh, how many activities out there can involve people from teenage to 80 or even older. Um, our summer chorus is a non-auditioned uh, group open to anyone, uh, and I'm talking about non-pandemic times, but uh, we would normally have about 175 people in our non-audition chorus and even probably a wider range of ages, teenagers to singers in their 90s. Uh, in that group. And think about that. Where in the world can you come up with an activity that involves people doing the same thing, a shared goal of creating this beautiful music uh, and enhancing our lives, but with all of those years represented? In our society today, we just don't have the opportunity to be together that much. People of my age will remember when there were three uh, television stations, three networks. Even I even remember when there were just two before ABC was out there. It was just CBS and NBC. Well, families tended to watch the same thing. Um, I will admit that I was forced to watch Lawrence Welk. I didn't enjoy it then, and I would not enjoy it now. But I watched it because my dad was watching it. And dad made the decisions about what we were going to watch at home. So we had shared experiences, but people just don't have those so much now. Uh, and so I think it's great that in choral music we can. I want to say a little about how I put my rehearsals together, because that's what I'm really supposed to be talking about, what we what we do in rehearsals uh, that would especially assist the aging voice. Now, let me just say that my rehearsals are very carefully planned with uh, attention to uh, easing into things uh, vocally. Uh, we usually incorporate uh, a short warm up, maybe about five minutes uh, at the beginning. Uh, but the first piece we rehearse is designed to sort of be an extension of that warm up, whatever I was doing in the warm up, whether it happened to be uh, something on breathing or resonance or vowel formation and unification, then I'll make sure that the first piece we do uh, will sort of carry on with that, uh, that idea. We always, and I repeat, always start on time. We always end on time because I believe that singers uh, deserve that level of respect from their director. Uh, a director who is not starting on time or running over the assigned time for ending the rehearsal because he or she just can't seem to get it all done is not uh, paying uh, appropriate respect, I think, to the people who have given their time to come to the, uh, to the rehearsal. So, firm believer in timing things to the minute. Uh, and if in a rehearsal, I find that I go, say, over five minutes on something that I had planned to spend seven minutes and I go 12 minutes on it, well, I know that I've got to find five minutes elsewhere in the rehearsal uh, that I will uh, tighten and and not use all of that time on the piece that I had scheduled uh, because we will end on time. Um, I have a personal goal uh, in every rehearsal to achieve for everyone and myself included what I call the five L's. Uh, that's the letter L. And these stand for listen, labor, learn, laugh, and love. Now, I would have preferred to have used uh, the, the word work instead of labor, 
but of course I needed labor for uh, alliteration. So uh, that's the reason I use that. So we listen, we listen to the music, we listen to each other. Uh, I listen to the singers, hopefully the singers listen to me, but there's listening going on. We labor, we work together for a shared purpose. Uh, and in doing so, that brings enormous satisfaction and a sense of accomplishment in the rehearsal time. We learn. If we're listening and we're laboring, we're working, listening and working together will almost always lead to learning something new. And what a wonderful goal to have in every rehearsal, that we are going to learn something. We laugh. I've always believed that a rehearsal without some some laughter uh, is an opportunity lost. Uh, life is short enough as it is. Let's not forget to laugh. And love is the final uh, L. I think loving the music, loving each other, uh, these things are essential attributes for a healthy chorus. Uh, I've seen many deep friendships formed within my choruses over the years, and I am sure that most of you have seen the same thing, observed the same thing in your choruses. Isn't it wonderful that in our ensembles, uh, such deep friendships uh, can be formed? Now, I want to make clear that I essentially treat the younger and older voices in a similar way. Uh, understanding, you know, everything that, that Karen so eloquently uh, expressed earlier and, and so uh, perfectly expressed. I mean, the older voice is, is different. I mean, I know that for a fact. I've, the first part of my career, uh, I split about 50-50 conducting and singing. Uh, so I had a, a, a something of a, a solo career in my 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, did a lot of Bach, had the opportunity to solo uh, five times with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra with Robert Shaw conducting. So I did sing, but I also mentioned in rehearsal this past Monday night, I was talking to uh, the sopranos who had a high C on uh, one of the pieces that we are doing. And I said, we're going to save that high C for later uh, because God only gives us a number of high Cs uh, and tenors and sopranos. And when they're gone, they're gone. And I said, I can attest to that because the day uh, came for me when all of a sudden that high C was not there anymore. And I heard this still small voice in the back of my head. I told you, it was not going to last forever. And sure enough, it didn't. So we have to adjust what the expectations of our, our voices will be as we, uh, as we get older. It's important to remind our singers, I think, as they age to follow a very healthy vocal practice regime. As Karen mentioned, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. You can't drink too much water. If a person needs to get up and leave the rehearsal and go visit the restroom, do it, then come back in and continue singing. Uh, but there is no reason we should not be drinking a lot of water and many reasons that we should. We need to stay physically active. Uh, we need to practice moderation uh, in our approach to singing. And this can be especially important, I think, for lifelong singers, someone who has been singing all his life, all her life, and they know how it used to feel. And now it doesn't feel that way. They can't sing a phrase as long as they did before. Okay, take more breaths. Uh, they, they find that their range is not what it once was. They can't sing some of those high notes that they once did. Well, that's all right. And someone who had been a soprano one or a tenor one might find that uh, they're going to move to soprano two or tenor two or even baritone or alto one. And sometimes the voices of move in the other direction. I find a number of male voices lose some of their uh, bass male voices, lose some of their low notes, uh, and their voices actually become a bit higher. So just 
be aware that and help your singers understand that it is not um, a sign of defeat to move from soprano one to soprano two. Uh, it is an opportunity to uh, once again have that level of satisfaction of knowing that you are really contributing uh, not only to the choral sound, but you're also going to have a, a more pleasing musical experience, vocal experience for yourself if you are singing where you need to be singing. I tell my singers, don't ever sing beyond your point of beauty. And if you're not sure where that point of beauty is, ask the person sitting beside you and he or she will tell you whether you have sung beyond your point of beauty. Now, today I'm gonna to share a general run through of the basic vocal techniques I employ with my singers. Uh, but following the webinar, you're going to receive links to videos uh, that explain and demonstrate all of these techniques and exercises. Uh, you can also access these videos by going to the Michael O'Neill Singers YouTube channel uh, and selecting Michael's Vocal Studio. Uh, and that will bring up, uh, uh, you can uh, put in a, a playlist that, uh, or it will bring up a playlist that includes all the videos that I'm about to very quickly describe. Each of these videos is uh, between eight and 12 minutes in length, and we'll go through all of the, the, the exercise. I'll describe it, and then I will also uh, perform it. This all came about during these last 18 months that we were doing uh, MOS online, as Terry mentioned. Uh, we created this. In fact, I, from the information that I sent Terry, it's even grown since then. We ended up uh, having singers from 35 states participate and 13 countries uh, over the uh, uh, 16 months or so that we were doing MOS online. We produced weekly YouTube videos where we would rehearse and ultimately perform. Sorry, I have to use air quotes one time. I hate the use of air quotes, but uh, we performed selections with previously recorded performances by MOS. I would conduct the pieces. I practiced to make sure that I was conducting what we had sung. Uh, and the singers, I would encourage them to wear earbuds or headphones uh, as they sang along. And the experience was very much like uh, standing in the middle of a, a scrambled choir formation. It wasn't ideal. Uh, but we were still able to attract, uh, as I said, hundreds of singers from, from all over the place. And I would guess, we didn't ask people their ages, but we would have Zoom times where, Zoom social times. And so I got to see a lot of the faces. M my guess is that uh, many, probably a majority of the singers were over 50 years of age. And so a lot of aging voices included there. Now, the videos that, uh, th that I mentioned, I developed for the online singers so they could work on specific areas of vocal technique where they might feel they wanted to find some improvement. Here's a breakdown of each video. As I've already mentioned, they're between eight and 12 minutes, uh, each of them. The first one is vocal relaxation and freedom. And I uh, use a yawn sigh in there. Oh, starting high, trying to get people to use the head voice and uh, especially the male voices and then come on down. And if it breaks it, as it goes into the chest, there's no problem with that at all. So the yawn sigh, I explain it and, uh, and, and perform it. Uh, lip trills. Um, uh, we know about those, I'm sure. Breathing and support is the second video. I talk about diaphragmatic breathing versus chest and clavicular breathing or shoulder breathing. Then I talk about uh, how to conserve the breath. Uh, because so often, even if we know how to take a good breath, uh, the untrained singer will quite often uh, expend way too much of the breath 
uh, when they begin to phonate, the, the very beginning of the phrase, they might lose half their breath. And uh, so I talk in that video, give examples about how to conserve the breath once it has been taken correctly. The third video is vowel formation and unification. It's basically the, the, the five basic vowels, uh, uh, e, e, a, o, u. Um, I talk about diphthongs also, and uh, and then variations of those five vowels, but forming those vowels, and then also uh, talking about how, in a choral situation, we need to unify our vowels. Some people with brighter voices might have brighter production of their vowels. Some people naturally form their vowels uh, a little more darkly, uh, and so in a choral situation, uh, where we need to unify the vowels, I give information about that. Uh, talk, uh, the fourth video is vocal resonance. I use uh, humming uh, as an aid to uh, establish uh, resonance. I also uh, do the nya exercise. My college uh, voice instructor uh, taught that to me years ago. He called it the nasty, nya, nya. And it, it's very good for developing and working with resonance. So I do a, a series of exercises that use both humming and the, the nya. Number five is extending vocal range. Uh, I, I utilize that yon sai as a range extender. Uh, I talked about the yon sai before. Uh, I suggest uh, how, give suggestions on how to relax the voice at the top and the bottom of uh, of the range uh then the sixth video is connecting vocal registers i give a description of the chest register head register and falsetto register and then exercises for how to blend the chest and the head I'm not going to blend the falsetto of course uh but to to blend the chest and the head registers which i think can be especially helpful for men. Uh, male voices tend to want, to the untrained male voice, wants to carry the chest voice up too high. And uh, I believe in bringing the head voice down into the chest uh, voice in uh, vocal exercises. So that's what we do there. Um, the playlist that I mentioned will also include a couple of warm-ups uh, for low and high voices that uh, I intended to help singers prepare on their own for a choral rehearsal. One thing we didn't do in our YouTube rehearsals in MOS Online was do a warm up because I was trying to keep the YouTube videos all with the under an hour. We just didn't have time really to do the choral warm up. So I suggested to people, please do your warm up before you come to the YouTube rehearsal. And therefore, I provided these, and they're about eight or nine minutes uh, uh, long. And so they utilize the yawn sigh and humming in the middle range, I believe. Uh, uh, it's very good to work in the middle range a lot, and then the yawn sigh to, uh, to relax. Well, I want to thank, thank all of you uh, uh, for allowing me to be a part of this, uh, this webinar. You know, I can't imagine my life without choral music. And, and these days, I'm especially uh, grateful for the older singers uh, in my chorus uh, who have so diligently sought ways during the pandemic to safely sing. They were instrumental in, in making our online program a success. Uh, and we've just recently, as I mentioned, resumed our in-person rehearsals. We're doing so fully masked and with full proof of vaccination for all singers. It's not a perfect solution, but it is wonderful to be back making choral music together once again. We've had two rehearsals thus far. Uh, and as I saw all those singers in the room just this past Monday night, socially distanced, um, I might add, I thought about how each of them carries uh, an individual light uh, in, in their body, which when combined with the other lights in the room becomes a huge flame uh, and a light that spreads and spreads. It's part of the mystery of choral singing. Uh, it's the gestalt that the whole is greater 
than the sum of its parts. I don't understand it. It's magic, but it is true, and it happens in choral music. I'd, I'd like to close my uh, portion of this webinar with a, a poem I wrote a number of years ago. Uh, it quotes the old uh, gospel song, This Little Light of Mine, and I think of all of my singers, but especially today, I'm thinking of my older singers who continue to contribute so very much to my chorus and to choruses around the country and around the world. Uh, it is so important to have you involved, not only for your personal life, but for the success of our choruses. So thank you. Here's the poem, and I end with this. Let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. These simple words learned years ago live in my heart today. May they be seen in what I do and heard in what I say. The beauty and humility expressed in that brief phrase remind me even one lone soul can brighten life's dark haze. And though there may be some who doubt and question what I say, I know that even my small flame can light another's way. So each day I will let it shine, this little steady light of mine, and pray someone may catch its ray to pass it on another day. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Michael. You might have expressed disbelief at being asked to join this panel, but everyone else understands why you were asked. <laughs> I think they would agree. So, Sandra, how about uh, sharing with us anything that you gleaned from the chat room? Yeah, so a lot of thanks to you, Michael, for the inspiration and talking about singing together again. Thank you, Sandra. Um, one question was regarding moderation. Does that mean that repertoire for the group will need to be modified to accommodate the order of voice, like easier phrasing, less demanding technique, and so on? I do not really, uh, in my groups, modify the the, the repertoire of, to, to consider that I have a, a number of older singers. What I would ask my older singers to do is sort of, as I suggested before, uh, if I'm saying this is a phrase I want you to sing, if you need to take a breath in the phrase, take a, a breath. Just don't breathe at a spot that um, uh, is going to uh, be a problem, you know. Uh, and so, uh, and, and then I also will suggest to people, if it gets too low or if it gets too high, drop out. You don't have to sing every note. But personally, I have not, because I have so many younger singers as well. Uh, now, I, I've conducted senior adult choirs. I was a church music director for many, many years. Uh, and I had a senior adult choir of about uh, 60 people. And obviously, that was all senior adults. And I picked the repertoire accordingly for that group. And uh, just a, a final one that Finley Woolston asked, um, and he said, this maybe could be at the end, but since you you did rather address this, Michael, could mm -hmm. someone talk about uh, singing through a mask? How do you work with your choir singing through a mask? Well, the as I mentioned, um, we just began two weeks ago. And so for these last 18 months, I've been doing everything online. There have been a lot of people who have been experiencing singing through masks you know, for much longer. Um, I have just experienced it for the last two weeks. And I must say, uh, while it's not what I would choose to do, it was, it bothered me much uh, less than I thought it might. The sound is still good. I'm hearing everything. And uh, while we all look forward to the time when we won't be able to do it, uh, it's, uh, I think it's a lot better than the alternative right now while the variant is still so rampant and uh, things are still dangerous out there. So it's not ideal, but uh, if we can sing socially distanced, uh, have good air handling in the room, be fully vaccinated, wear masks, I, I say it's good, let's do it. And that's all for now, Terry. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you so much, Michael. I agree with you. If it's our only alternative, 
after the grief we've suffered, having to give up singing it, being seen as a super spreader event, as benign as our activity is, then it's a small price to pay. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, and I hope to see you soon. We live at opposite ends of Atlanta, so we uh, don't run into each other, but maybe we can make that happen. Um, let me introduce to you our new national chair for community choirs. Matt Hill is, uh, earned his master's at Oklahoma State in 2012 and a doctorate at University of Nebraska at Lincoln in 2019, and he's the director of choral activities at Peru State University. He founded Sing Omaha, Inc. in 2007, and it's a nonprofit that offers eight choirs serving more than 350 singers in the Omaha metro each year. Additionally, two studios where student, 150 students are enrolled in weekly private lessons. To his knowledge, it's the only nonprofit of its sort that actually serves K through 12 through adult and senior adult singers all under one umbrella organization. He's a two-time Choral Conductor of the Year in Nebraska and won the Teaching Excellence Award uh, at Peru State in 2019 and serves the Nebraska Choral Directors Association as its operations manager. And Matt is uh, eager to step in and share with us a wonderful array of repertoire suggestions related to our aging singers. So welcome, Matt. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. It is uh, a joy to be here. I will echo the sentiments from my esteemed colleagues, Drs. Brunson and O'Neill. Uh, what, a, what a privilege it is to be able to participate in this conversation and to share uh, some things that have worked for me. Uh, I'm anxious. I'm grateful to have learned from the, the first two presenters and anxious to learn from those of you who are attending. I've been watching questions come through in the chat. Uh, and look forward to continued discussion after this webinar. So thanks to ACDA, to Sundra, to you, Dr. Johnson, for helping to facilitate this conversation. Uh, had I known that the entire bio was going to be read, I would have sent something shorter. My apologies, and thanks all for your patience. Uh, I think what's important to know is that I have uh, had the opportunity to work with voices of all ages. Uh, I work with a church choir weekly whose average age is uh, greater than 60 years old. Uh, and we are also just back after 18 months or so off due to COVID. And uh, so the, these kinds of uh, challenges are a regular uh, opportunity that I have to, to work both in terms of repertoire selection, but uh, to, again, to Dr. Brunson and Dr. O'Neill's thoughts and points. How are we, how are we teaching phonation? What are we doing in terms of modification of repertoire to in, ensure that our singers are comfortable, that they're contributing at a high level, but that they're also physically comfortable and able to do that? So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, it'll get me the opportunity to get this PowerPoint for you. Um, and we'll, we'll go through. Does that look okay to everybody? Great. So we're moving on here. Are you seeing this presenter view or just the main slide? Are we okay? We're seeing the presenter view. I'm sorry for that. That's better. So uh, we have heard great ideas and information. Uh, just a quick rundown of the things that I'll that I'll discuss with uh, with you all is viewing the choral rehearsal as a corporate voice lesson, and I think. Uh, we, we've heard a little bit about that. I hope to expand on that. Specific conversation around vowel modification in the upper and lower extremes of the ranges, uh, which is different for biological males versus biological females, uh, and can manifest itself differently depending on the age of the singer. Like Dr. O'Neill, I am working with uh, an ensemble at the community level uh, that has a, a diverse age range. And so some singers are making their own modifications as we vocalize together and as we sing through repertoire. So I was so grateful to hear him say that. Um, road mapping, which is floating and covering other parts. We'll talk specifically about that. CPDL, which is the Choral Public Domain Library. Uh, as a programming resource, I hope we're all aware of that. And if not, then we, 
we're going to share something really beautiful with you today. Uh, and the ability to transpose much of the repertoire that's available to us at CPDL. Uh, I'm going to share just a little bit about Robert Shaw's choral warmups, but I'm going to lean on Dr. Johnson to share firsthand experience uh, about the value and the purpose of those exercises. There's some resources we can share. Uh, and then I have compiled, begun to compile, and I'll need your help to continue to flesh out a repertoire list. I solicited input from colleagues, church and community choir directors around the Midwest with whom I'm directly connected, uh, just to try to build a list of things that work reasonably well for aging voices because of multiple factors. And we'll talk more about that as we go. So thanks very much again to be here today. Uh, I'll be as brief as I can. The, the choral rehearsal as a corporate voice lesson uh, is the fundamental way which I approach every rehearsal. Uh, we are teachers of singing, whether that's happening one-on-one -on -one in a studio setting, in small groups, or in large ensembles. And I think if we are cognizant of that, we uh, benefit as a group, uh, and we also have an opportunity to continue to grow our individual singers. So I hope that you'll uh, get on board if you're not already with that sort of a mindset. With that in mind, I think it's okay for us to teach fundamental fo phonation concepts. I'm certainly not the pedagogue that Dr. Brunson is, uh, but, but the ability to speak and to model, to use other singers in the ensemble to model healthy, beautiful singing uh, is a wonderful way for us to encourage healthy phonation and assimilation into an ensemble sound. I think it's important for us to discuss in advance the tone color that we want for each piece. Some call for a warmer, darker sound, others for something a little more biting, some with a little more bright core in the middle. Uh, certainly we talk about consonant placements, both at the beginning and end, as well as intervocalic consonants. But I think giving the ensemble some descriptive adjectives to use, analogies. I know you all do that beautifully. Uh, it helps them to mentally prepare for the kind of sound that you're going to ask them to make, uh, which I think, it, frankly, is efficient, uh, but it's also friendly. Um, as you're vocalizing, I appreciated Dr. O'Neill's conversation about the, the warm-up, certainly outside of the, the virtual experience where they're warming up on their own. But when we're together, uh, I'm always conscientious about trying to make sure that we're, we're warming up on unison exercises that get the voice going and that those exercises take us to and through passaggio, uh, differentiating between head voice and falsetto in male singers, uh, encouraging the female singers to access head voice in a healthy and free way with no real regard for dynamics so long as they're physically comfortable. Uh, and then like pulling a shade down over a window, pulling that head voice sound down into the chest voice range to give the color variety uh, and the physical comfort uh, in that phonation exercise. So uh, the, that, that warm up time being about setting the mindset that we use the voice differently for singing than we do for speaking, I think is number one. Uh, and I think unison warm ups have a really wonderful opportunity for us to engage our minds in using the, the singing voice. But I also am, am of the firm belief that the unison vocalese warm-up time is insufficient for the choral rehearsal. We spend the entire choral rehearsal singing in parts, largely, I mean, unless you're a chant chorus. Uh, and so having an opportunity to work dynamics and vowel unification in four parts, transposing up and down by half step or whole step, training the ear in that way, in, an, in a, a friendly and low pressure time, as opposed to when we're in the middle of trying to learn or prepare repertoire, I think has a, a, an immediate applicable uh, use as we move into the, the repertoire portion of the rehearsal. So I'd encourage you to go one step beyond the unison vocalises, which are important as we prepare the voice for singing for the full rehearsal, but to have an intermediary step if you're not already and vocalize in parts. You can even use sections of your repertoire for that and sing on a neutral syllable if that's helpful. Uh, but again, it gets the ear moving as well as the voice. I would encourage you as a singer, and I, kn I know you all do this, but be, be proud of the singer that you are and model for your singers. I think it's important that they hear you, that they know that you are a singer too. Uh, and then I always like to, to lean on individual singers or half of a row or my front row altos, turn around and sing to the second row altos, please. I really like that sound. Our singers can learn by listening. Uh, we save the voices of some of our singers if we're allowing individuals or small groups to sing and be tone models. Uh, it, gives, it gives a mental rest and an opportunity to make some notes in the score. Uh, so don't be afraid to 
not everybody has to sing the whole time, I guess is the point. It's okay to, to break out little sections and have them do that. Uh, and thankfully uh, for me, because I don't have the, the breadth and depth of knowledge uh, that Dr. Brunson does, it doesn't, we're not required to be uh, expert vocal pedagogues in order to make an impact on the way that our singers are creating sound. Uh, so we certainly want to speak from, from a place of uh, having been educated and being informed, but it's not a requirement that you be an expert in the mechanism in order to speak intelligently about how to encourage folks to sing in a beautiful and healthy way. So I, I just don't want anybody to be intimidated by that. So as we think about vowel modification, uh, this works in my vocalises as well as uh, in the rehearsal. I spend the majority of my time talking about tone. Um, so as we, as we wanna get brighter, I'm asking for a, a, a relaxed and open embouchure, but the E sound mixed in brings those formants forward, that bright resonant core into the center of the vowel. I really appreciated what Dr. Brunson said. I actually made a sticky note here on my desk that the bright vowels inform the dark vowels. I've never heard it said that way, but I, I do love that, that verbiage. The idea that the, the resonant core vibration happens through the center of what is otherwise an open and warm resonant cavity, I think is really important. And, and so thinking about the extremes of those sounds, the extreme bright vowel of E and the extreme dark vowel of O. Now, I, I very rarely, if ever, go so far as A because it has such a tendency to over darken. I, I try to save that until I'm actually working on a, a vowel syllable in the repertoire that requires it. Um, but O, open O or U uh, for darker modifications, uh, particularly as we're moving into first and second registration head voice in the male voice, uh, encourages the open, relaxed embouchure shape, but keeps the sound forward so as not to get that sort of pseudofetti head voice, oh, you know, I've got a really bad cold kind of a sound, uh, which at least my male singers have a tendency to, to do sometimes. Uh, certainly your tenors and basses do not, but uh, mine do, and so that's something I have to, to work through. Um, Another philosophical thing for me is that I'm always willing to sacrifice pronunciation of diction in favor of beautiful, well-supported tone. So I'm, sopranos, as we modify, as we reach fourth line D on the treble staff and higher, I'm encouraging an open modification to O. All the vowels can change to O as far as I'm concerned, and the altos and tenors and basses can take care of the diction underneath. Uh, I would rather hear something that's beautiful and ringing and resonant and free over the top of the staff than a, a, a pinched E vowel uh, that doesn't tune well and whose timbre doesn't match the mood of the section or doesn't match the rest of the, of the choir. So uh, I'm always willing to sacrifice diction in favor of beautiful tone. And it has taken some time for me to convince some of my church singers that that's okay. Uh, but now, uh, just we had our, our second rehearsal since COVID last night, and uh, I told Judy that I would be quoting her, and she said, I, I don't really have to think about these now. She did raise her hand and say, is it okay for me to change this F natural to an O vowel? And I said, yes, please, Judy, we would all like that, and I think you would too. Um, so building in the habit and giving them permission to make those changes, because I think it's not that they're that they feel, at least in my experience, that they're being asked to do something that's abnormal. They just don't want to feel as though they are a detraction from what the ensemble is trying to achieve. So if we can explain that the modification actually assists them physically and aids into the, the beauty of the ensemble sound, uh, they're much more inclined to, to make those shifts. So next is this concept of road mapping. Uh, I like to utilize my singers as much as possible. We all know that in choral music, there are times when sopranos are singing a little eight bar section and the altos are not. Well, unless there's a balance reason, you know, singing with a small orchestra or something, or the timbre just doesn't match, I see no reason for the altos not to sing along with the sopranos, at least up to a point where the range is comfortable for them and then they may drop out. Uh, so soprano singing alto, instead of observing four bars of rest, uh, this is healthy, I think, for singers to extend their ranges and experiment with timbre. I think it's also important, we're talking about aging voices today. Uh, I think some, in some cases, um, aging voices have determined that they are a voice part because that's what their elementary or middle school or high school choral director told them 10 years ago or 30 years ago. And so they identify as a soprano and wouldn't dare consider ever being an alto and, and, and don't, don't care for for having been pigeonholed that way. So I, I really loved what Dr. O'Neill mentioned about 
giving them permission and making sure that they know it's okay and they've not been demoted in any way if you ask them to move from soprano one to soprano two, either on a temporary basis for one section of a song or, or permanently for their vocal health and for the health of the ensemble. Uh, again, I think it's important as we're asking sections to sing in other sections parts that we encourage that vowel modification, uh, particularly as they ascend the scale. So constantly drawing back to the vocal work that we've done at the beginning of the rehearsal and reminding them about tools that they can practically apply in the, in the, the art of music making uh, that allows them to sing in a healthy way, but also in a beautiful way. Another example here, altos and tenors can float to each other's parts in, in many cases. Um, do be aware that mixing tenors and altos together creates a unique timbre. The brightness generally of a, of a tenor sound in an alto range mixed with the warmth and depth of an alto uh, creates a really beautiful sound, but not it's not going to be a, a thick, rich, dark alto mezzo -y sound that you might be accustomed to. Uh, so you may prefer from a timbral perspective not to do that, but I'd encourage you to experiment with it, particularly if there's a balance issue. Um, be, be comfortable. Sopranos twos aren't the only ones who can help the altos and vice versa. Uh, tenors and baritones, of course, can float to each other. Uh, and I would encourage you as you're thinking through and doing your score study to make some of those decisions in advance. I mark in my score who I'd like to cover what part, uh, particularly in those instances where the tenors have 16 bars of rest and the baritones are singing. Tenors, if you're comfortable down there, go ahead and sing with them. There's no reason not to. And then they know from the start how to be rehearsing. Uh, it also, I think, is more fun to be singing than it is to be resting. I hear that from my singers. Uh, so uh, we can certainly go too far down that road, but I would encourage you to give some thought to how we can best utilize the singers in the room. I'd be interested to know from, from Dr. O'Neill uh, and from Dr. Brunson at some point in your experience, the lag in a rehearsal if they're seated for too long if we're if we're rehearsing altos for for seven minutes on a section and everyone else has rested what kind of uh impact that might have on on phonation and um, so that uh, that's an aside but i am interested to, to learn from the two of you uh, on that point so do make those road mapping decisions in advance and and i guess the other thing to say is you have permission to do that just because the score says that it's altos doesn't mean that you can't have sopranos sing it you're okay to make that choice. So uh, feel free in your, in your directorship uh, to make decisions that are in the best interest of your ensemble. I hope that's an okay thing to say. Uh, and so here we are at CPDL, the Coral Public Domain Library. What an incredible resource we have here. This is free public domain music, some of which are classics by composers who we all know and have studied our whole lives, as well as modern music, composers who are living and composing and writing today, who choose in some cases to share on CPDL versus going through traditional publishers or going through the self-publishing route. There is wonderful music out there. The biggest problem I have with CPDL is that there's so much music, it's hard to dig through. Uh, but they do have a searchable database. You can search by composer, by title. If you're looking for a Kyrie, go and search Kyrie and by SATB voicing, and you're going to see a slew of options come up, all of which have access to scores that you're free to record, free to print, free to share digitally. That's the public domain nature of the, the resource. Uh, and I think importantly for this conversation, many of those titles have a finale and or a Sibelius file associated with the link, which would mean then if you have access to that software or if you know somebody who does, you could make modifications to the parts. Certainly, I'm not suggesting we should rewrite Mozart. I am suggesting, however, that if transposition is helpful with three or four clicks of a mouse, if that finale or Sibelius file exists with the title that you'd like to do, that transposition can happen. And then you've got a PDF that you can either print off or share with your ensemble that's in a more suitable key as we think about extreme ranges uh, for, for some of our aging voice singers. Uh, as an aside here, I am comfortable in both Finale and Sibelius, uh, and if you come across something on CPDL and you don't have access to or expertise or comfort in those, those programs and would like to have something transposed, I'd be happy to hear from you anytime. It is a, it is a quick turnaround to make that happen, and uh, if I can be a resource in that way, please don't hesitate to, uh, to contact me. I'm happy to help. Here's an example, just so you see visually. So if we go search for Heilig by Mendelssohn, this is the screen that shows up on CPDL. And you see two of those three, uh, first three options there. We've got PDFs for all of them. Uh, but the, the, the second and third, published in 2004 and 1999 respectively, both have finale files with them that you can download and then 
transpose or modify, if the, you need to make the lyric font bigger maybe uh, for, for an aged voice choir whose vision may not be uh, what it used to be. And particularly when those fonts are 10 point or smaller, they're hard to read. Uh, so those kinds of changes can be made again, very quickly, easily and for free. Uh, so I, I do that for my church choir quite often, you know, as we as we stand in front of the Xerox machine and zoom in as much as we can to fill up as much of the page with ink. This can be done in advance uh, with these digital files. So I just wanted you to know that that's a, a resource that's available with many of the titles uh, published on CPDL so that, you know, you have some flexibility. Uh, Robert Shaw, who we all know and revere. Uh, has published on his website uh, his, his warmups, and these warmups include on the website there, uh, and the URL is above, robertshaw.website slash speeches, has all of the warmups, and this includes visual examples, so score examples written out, audio sample recordings, and explanations of the purpose of each of those warmups. So uh, I have embraced this. I was just made aware of them about two years ago, and then right, COVID happened. Uh, but since we've been back, I'm incorporating these vocal exercises, both the, the unison work and the ensemble singing work, the, the, the four part uh, stacked uh, harmonies and working, it, it allows you to work dynamic swell and, and decay, uh, vowels, extremes from E, A, O, O, and back. Uh, and I'm, I'm not the expert, certainly that Dr. Uh, Terry Johnson is. I'd, I'd like to invite Dr. Johnson in to share uh, from his firsthand experience uh, with Robert Shaw, some of the, the purposes, maybe the value that he's seen and experienced. So Dr. Johnson would love to hear from you about uh, these warm-up exercises. Well, I'd be happy to uh, briefly speak about them and uh, also remind everyone we're nearing uh, the end of the third segment. Please stay on for a one question survey that will appear when it's over. That will especially uh, allow us to give continuing ed credit for anyone who, or professional development credit for anyone who's looking for that. Uh, I just had forgotten to mention that earlier. Um, I, I had the, you know, incredible opportunity uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s to accompany a good bit for Robert Shaw and to become friends with him. And I can remember the first time I saw him warm up a choir and I thought it was some kind of voodoo magic. I just never heard anything happen that wasn't just, ah, ah, you know, in a, in a choir rehearsal. And uh, I, I was, um, oh, I have been surprised throughout the years as I've heard choirs warm up and use only singing major scales and arpeggios as a warm up and then go into rehearsing a minor piece or to, uh, to uh, rehearse only at a full voice level and then go into a piece that required a lot of expression. And it seemed to me that, that there were possibilities in the warm-up to rehearse crescendo, diminuendo, um, intervals that assisted you in both minor and major scale uh, modes. Uh, many, many of those things that we are uh, calling upon our singers to do, we can prepare them to do through our warm-up. So you'll find examples uh, at Mr. Shaw's uh, website that will allow you to uh, incorporate some of his ideas. And here are some that I do every single week with my amateur church choir. Uh, one that all of us who ever sang with Shaw, there are probably many of us on this, uh, on this uh, Zoom call who did, uh, one of the things we remember is uh, an exercise with the vowels ooh and ah, and with ascending intervals. So you would begin with a minor third and sing ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, and then raise the upper one to a major third. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, and you would continue raising the upper pitch. I do it with my choir. I start on G going up to B flat and a minor third, and I go all the way up to E natural to a major sixth and then back down again. Then I change the exercise as Mr. Shaw did to a triple meter. I start on B natural going to D as a minor third and I raise the upper pitch all the way to F sharp uh, as a top pitch. And in, in triple meter, it just goes whoa, whoa. Well, what happens is throughout the rehearsal, singers never sing an interval they have not already rehearsed. And I find that it helps them uh, enormously in that. And it also is legato without interruption. And they have learned line and legato singing. 
Another thing we do is rehearse crescendo and diminuendo every single week. When I ask for it in a piece of music, we have already rehearsed it. I do it in a four part chord, but not a diatonic triad, because then every pitch is a little bit more present and I can hear them. So I sing, uh, I start them with perhaps bass on F, tenors on A, altos on G, sopranos on B natural. So that there are two major triads and we start piano and we, we crescendo to forte over eight counts evenly. Then we reverse that and diminish evenly over eight counts. Another one that we do that uh, always surprises my choir and yet they're pretty good at it is the exercise he used to do where you sing on nu or lu and you sing a quarter note followed by a quarter wrist and you sing 16 in a row and you raise each one essentially a 16th of a half step. So that when you hold the 16th one, you have imperceptibly raised the pitch of the entire choir by a half step. And it seems a little esoteric, but what I uh, find is that when we come to the final extended note of a chord at the end of a piece, I can say to the choir, you need to sharp as you hold it, and they know exactly what to do. And they can keep in tune as their body's oxygen uh, level depletes. Those are just some ideas, but you should look at the website and find his description and the audio and visual examples of it and see how they might serve you and your choir. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for sharing that personal experience. I can certainly point people to the website, but uh, yours is an invaluable voice to share in this, in this conversation. Uh, so as I shared earlier, I have uh, started to build a repertoire list with the assistance of colleagues, and I would love your assistance. So if you've got titles that have worked for you, if you're working with ensembles with aging voices, uh, things that either work because of their range, their tessitura, the support that comes from the accompaniment, any other factors, uh, I would love to be able to add those titles. Uh, I've just narrowed initially here to SATB voicing, but if you'd like to see me, uh, tenor bass music or treble music. I work with three treble choirs every week. Uh, I love treble music and would be happy to create separate tabs in that sheet uh, to include so that this could be perhaps a standing resource available at ACDA's website uh, for us to continue to go back to with updated literature. So uh, please re reach out, share your title, share your experience and your expertise. Uh, finally, just a, a, a a quick statement here that I think echoes what we've heard from, from our other two presenters. Singers of all ages and at all stages of development want the same things from their choral experiences. They wanna be cared for, they wanna be believed in, they want to be equipped with practical skills to improve, and they want to both bring value to the experience and to derive value from it. It is your thoughtfulness and expertise as the conductor that make those things possible. So thank you for your continued investment into the singers in our ensembles as individuals and as family members uh, in our groups. Thanks also once again for the opportunity to be here. It was my pleasure uh, to learn from Drs. Brunson and O'Neill. Uh, my pleasure to represent ACDA as the, the community choirs r and &R. And again, please, please be in touch if I can be of any assistance. It'd be uh, a pleasure to hear from any of you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matt. And thanks to all of our wonderful uh, panel. And uh, I don't want to, uh, Sandra, you can give us guidance here. We're, we have reached ex almost exactly the time limit that we had placed on this, but at the same time, there may be questions that you want to pose to Matt. So you got us, Sandra. Um, I might suggest that there weren't, there weren't very many specific questions on this and we are over time. Um, we, will, uh, we will ask the panelists to maybe post um, responses in the Facebook comments. We'll, we'll post some of that as follow-up. And um, we can also do a little bit of that on when we post the um, recording and so on on our national webinars page. How wonderful. Thank you, Sandra. And thanks to everyone for your attention and your great questions. Thanks to our panel. And thanks most of all to everyone in ACDA for leading singers in an inspiring way as we come out of the pandemic. Thanks and good night to everyone.